All right, welcome everyone. My name is Adam Krutinger, and today we're going to be doing some puppet building live. Now, what we're going to be starting off with is uh, how to do the pattern making process. And to be honest, that's what probably this whole session will be because it can be a tedious pro process. But I'm going to make sure I save time at the end to do some Q&A for you all, as well as um, if you want any specific techniques that you want shown, I can do that for you as well. Okay. I uh, just want to make sure, too, everyone can hear me pretty well, too. There's no problems at all? No technical? Okay, good. All right, so if you've seen some of my videos before, you know a technique that I like to do is to sculpt the sh head, the, is to sculpt the shape of the head out of clay like this, okay? You can sculpt any, uh, you know, type of design that you desire, and then you cover it with tape, and then you can peel the pattern off it like that. Now, one thing that a lot of people have told me is that, you know, they don't have clay and they don't want to get clay and what kind of clay to use, this type of uh, questions like that. And the truth is, you don't have to use clay at all. You can use pretty much anything that you want to get the shape from. If you saw my contribution to the uh, puppet chain letter, you, you saw that I did this real guerrilla style of puppet uh, pattern making by just taking objects around the house and then covering it with fabric to create the pattern with it. Uh, in that case, I used a ball and some tape and things like that. But another really quick process that I like a lot, it's actually common in cosplay and all types of things like that, is to use tin foil for your puppet head. So that's what we're going to do today, and I'm going to show you that process right now. Now, I'm going to start off with some sort of a base. You don't have to use a base like this. I just think it'll be best for a presentation uh, like this. But also, it, it is kind of handy to have if you can make something like this. I just made this out of a, a th half inch piece of plywood, a two by four, and uh, just a dowel rod, about a half inch wide to get started. So, let me show you a couple different things here. So I'm going to start off just by building up the shape that I want. Today, um, today I want to kind of do a puppet-shaped uh, head with a muzzle. Kind of like this one, but not quite. But uh, let's just kind of see what we come up with. I'm just going to kind of do a little uh, aluminum foil sculptural jazz. Okay. Oh, having these screws on there is just going to help keep this uh, form from rotating, too. So that's just a little, a little tip. Uh, one more little tip with this, too, is the bigger that you actually make the sculpture, the, the least amount you have to blow it up, the scale up the pattern, which is kind of like a handy little thing, too. So if you don't have a lot of time and you're not going to be able to scale it up later, you're going to want to do it true to size so you can make that pattern. But uh, with my patterns, I like to almost always scale it up later because that allows me to um, use less tinfoil or less of materials of whatever I'm using. That being said, if you are going to be doing a bigger piece, you can use like um, newspaper or something as a base inside of it to kind of not use as much of the aluminum foil so you don't waste it. But today we're going to be doing it a little smaller. You'll be surprised how detailed you can actually sculpt uh, tinfoil as well, which is kind of nice. I think I want kind of more of a flat uh, head in the front, just thinking about how my patterning is going to be coming together a little later. And you can actually cut into this pretty well, too, and do some subtractive type style of uh, sculpting. Starting to get ahead, literally. Now, the other nice thing is, too, you only really need to worry about half of the sculpture, okay? It's nice to kind of do the whole sculpture to get a sense of the form and uh, the scale. However, it's not completely necessary. And I 
See, I'm kind of liking that. Make sure it's in a good shape like that. I like it. Now, I think I'm going to do a little bit of a cheek on this character as well. Let me add that on. like that how that shapes coming out there okay now some of my pieces are kind of falling off so I'm gonna kind of put one more big piece on it as thin as I can just as kind of like a shell this isn't necessarily mandatory to do but it depends on how many pieces you use you can see it's kind of my cheek doesn't have a lot of support there so I'm just gonna do one more big piece Pretty good. Let me snap a picture of that for you guys so you guys can put it on the. Check it out later. Boom, here we go. All right. So that's looking pretty good. Now, the next step, what I'm going to do is to start covering this with the masking tape, okay? And that's another thing people ask, too, is can they use other tapes? You absolutely can. In my opinion, though, the masking tape is the best. Uh, some people do use duct tape. The problem with duct tape, duct tape that you can get if you're not careful is duct tape has a little bit of stretch to it, right? Kind of like electrical tape as well has that little bit of stretch, and that can make some of your forms not as true as they need to be. So that's one thing to definitely keep in mind. But let me get my masking tape. I'm going to start wrapping up this head. It's important to overlap the tape as you're going. And really press it down so it lays down as flat as you can, but try not to change your sculpture shape by pressing too hard. Again, about those other tapes, you absolutely can use duct tape to do this. But uh, again, I just think it's, in my opinion, it's not as ideal. Especially on a sculpture of this scale. If you were doing uh, like a walk around character, or no, I should say, what should I say? Let's say, you know, that's why you see it a lot in, in costume building or things like that. Like if you're going to make a dress form of yourself, you're like, it, the scale is so large, you can use the duct tape. But the problem is, at this small scale, once you blow it up, you're blowing up all your imperfections as well. So the larger your sculpture is, the more wiggle room you have for imp imperfections. So just keep that in mind. You know, 
And another thing a lot of people ask is, because uh, once we get to drawing the darks and the lines, the scenes on here, I'll get deeper into it. But really the best way to learn this is to just jump in and do it and make mistakes. You really learn something every time you do uh, one of these sculptures and try making the patterns from it. Especially when you start playing around with different shapes. This part's almost like paper mache. You really want to build up a couple layers because only one layer of tape won't be enough to probably hold the shape you want. If you think about it, we're technically kind of making a shell that's going to go, that's going around this head. And again, we're going to have a formal Q&A at the end. However, if you do have any questions during the process, um, you should be able to type them into the chat. And I believe Kate is going to be reading some of them, if you have any. Particularly ones that are um, related to what we're doing at the, in the moment. Okay, let me just get a couple more pieces of tape here. And I'll check it over. Okay. So I've got to get some under the head there a little bit more. Okay. One thing that's hard to plan out when you're doing this, this part of it is where to put the entrance hole for the puppet. So what I do is I, um, I just ignore that until I have a foam sculpture. Then when I actually blow it up and make the foam sculpture, I just draw, I just cut the hole in wherever I need it. And if I really like my placement, then I just transfer that to my pattern so that I know that for next time. We'll do one more piece and then I think we're going to be ready to start drawing our darks on. <coughs> Where's my... Actually just one more for the back of the head too, just to make sure these stay symmetrical. Okay, so that looks good. Now we have our head covered with the tape. At least half of it covered. This side is, uh, is not as covered. Let me just get another picture here so we can, we can follow it along with the process later too. Okay. Now I'm gonna start drawing those darks on. Now, this is the thing that people tend to ask the most questions about, because they want to know, where do you put the darks? Where do you put the, the scene lines? The point where you want to draw the lines are at the highs and lows. So again, looking at this in silhouette, this is one of the high points sticking out here. The nose sticking out is one of the high points. And even in the back of the head, we have a high point here. And of course, our low points here are inside this crease where the front of the face meets the muzzle. Okay, and then there's just some lower parts. So if this is the high part of the head, then this is like a lower part of the head. And, and also just, just look at uh, things around you that have any so sort of form that were created out of a flat material. So things to think about are looking at like a baseball. You know, one day I, I, I ask you to Google that, okay? So at one point later, when you think about it, Google the pattern for a baseball. The, the shape won't surprise you, but you'll probably go, huh, you know, it'll kind of like, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's why it's like that. Even look at the lines on a basketball. 
you know there's a lot of different ways to put these shapes together and and again just from that example alone the shape of a basketball and the shape of a baseball are both spheres they're the same shape but they have very different patterns on the way that they go together so that's kind of evidence on there really being no wrong way to do it but another rule of uh of thumb is the more lines you have the more accurate your pattern will be but also one thing that a philosophy that i have is i like to have the least amount of lines possible because that just creates more work for you to do later and especially if you have a ton of pattern pieces um for as far as remembering how it goes back together later so let's say i make this whole pattern i put it in a folder and come back to it in two years i'm like oh boy there's so many pieces where do they all go and i know what you're saying you think why don't you just label it i don't have time for that i just want it to be self-explanatory i want to know how it goes together so i try to really make it into the fewest amount of pieces as possible at least that's what's worked really well for me so Getting back to this, let me start drawing some of these lines on, okay? Where you always want to start is the center seam. So decide exactly where you want the center seam to be. Should be in the center, right? Try to make it as straight as possible. You'll thank yourself later. And uh, another reason why the center seam is just important uh, it's center seams and side seams generally, and that's a technique I learned when I was pattern making for clothing. I used to do some tailoring and dressmaking, and it's a lot of the same types of principles when you're doing this. Uh, this would be called like a draping form of pattern making. Okay, so you always want to start with your center seam, just like that. Okay, and then another good thing to do is your side seam. Okay, now if this uh, side seam didn't have so clearly I'm going for like a wolf or fox like look with this cheek sticking out but again most puppets don't have a detail like that so this side seam wouldn't necessarily have to go all the way to the bottom of the puppet if that piece wasn't there it could lay flat but since this is a high point I'm gonna have to take that into account so I'm gonna do my side seam Think about on your pants, you have a side seam and you have the inseam. So this is like my inseam and this is like my side seam here. So I'm just going to come underneath it too. Okay. So that's the bare minimum start of where I want my seams to be. Okay. Now, looking at this again, where are my low spots? So I did my highest spots. Now I want to do some of my lowest spots. So one of my low spots is right here where the muzzle meets the front of the head. Okay, so I'm going to start drawing a line across that. Okay, and one thing I know I'm going to do too um, is where I want the mouth to be in the puppet. So I'm going to draw the mouth in as well. So I want this puppet to have a little bit of an overbite. So I'm going to draw the mouth in just by creating a seam. Okay, and you can label this stuff, but once you get a hang of it, you'll be able to kind of remember what things are as you're going. Okay. So now looking at this too, uh, I know this muzzle kind of wants to be its own piece. So I am going to connect the bottom of the mouth, which I actually want to come out a little bit further up, to that. So right now that's going to be its own piece. But it still has a lot of form to it, so I'm probably going to have to break it up a little bit more. Okay. So at the end of the day, we want to take this pattern and be able to make it lay down flat. Okay. So if I'm going to divide it into even more pieces, I like to do that on paper after it's already flat. So let me just kind of create a couple darts here. There we go. Okay. I'll make a couple of registration marks too. Those are just places where I know I want 
these to be glued together. Okay. So I know along the back of this head, I'll need at least a few darts here. I'm going to have this come down like that. Once you get around the bottom of the neck, it just gets weird. So again, I, I just kind of try to make that as flat as possible and worry about it once it's in foam form and then transfer that information. So as you can see that, I'm getting all these darts here. Now around this cheek, some interesting stuff is going on and I'm not sure how much I really want to keep this pattern as simple as it can. I think this back will lay flat the way it is. I think it will. If not, I can adjust it after I take it off. This front, I don't think it will. But again, I don't want to make too many pieces for myself. But let me just... What can I do here? What the... What if I put it... Yeah, I will make this a separate piece here. I'm going to go straight across to here so that that's all one piece. And I'll put a, a dart there. We'll see how that works out. And actually, I do want more of a forehead, so I'm going to put a line here. And I'm going to have this one actually come all the way down. And I'm going to change this, get rid of that. I'm going to make it just a dart here. So I'll see if that works. And if I have to adjust it, I'll adjust it. All right, so we have that. Now the next component is going to be starting to cut off, cut this off into smaller pieces that I can start sticking to a piece of paper. All right, so I'm going to do that right now. Let me get this paper here. And uh, why don't I zoom in a little bit? Let's see if I can zoom in here. There we go. <clears throat> Always think be careful when you're using this type of tools. But I'm going to do my center seam first. This part's a little easier with the clay, in my opinion. The clay is softer and it just kind of takes the knife better. The tin foil's fighting it a little bit. And also a sharp um, X-Acto blade is always the sh safest option. seams too, these darts. I try to make sure all these darts are at a 90 degree, degree angle from where they came out of. Won't always be perfect because of uh, the shape of the head. So you want to get as close to 90 as possible. You'll thank yourself later when you're going to glue this together. here so I remember that that's where that goes together. One's on the way out here. This is a slightly more complex um, shape 
and what I've taught before on the channel, but let's get into it here. And again, the more accurate you want to be to your shape, the more pieces you'll have. Again, for me at this stage, and I know this is going to be covered in fur too, so once you add the layer of fur, it's going to affect the whole shape of this overall, and a lot of your um, quote-unquote sculpting will be of shaving the fur down in different areas. That's going to make this part here much longer because I'm going to leave the fur a little longer here and trim it down real short on the muzzle on top of the head. So that's going to make these cheeks stick out even more. So those are things to think about when you're designing your head. Okay, I know that's mad at me. Okay, I think, is this my last seam? Oh, I gotta do this one too. Oops. All right, whew, there we go. So now we have this piece. All the seams are cut, I believe. If I, if I missed one, I'll get it as I go along. And then I'm gonna start slowly peeling it off and putting it onto this paper. Let's see if this is a better shot here. Yeah, that's a good shot. I'm going to do it backward from me, so forgive me if I, if I make a mistake here. I want you guys to have the best view. I can see it's taking up that layer of the aluminum foil, which is totally fine. This tape wants to be flat. Um, I want it to be as well. Adam, we have a question for you while you're peeling sure, that apart. Sure, what's up? Scott is asking, is it better to cut the darts while it's still in the sculpture form, or should that wait until the pieces have been removed? You can do it either way. It depends on how many pieces you have. Sometimes it's hard to get the tape off without cutting those off. The more you cut ahead, the easier it'll be to get off in general. And, uh, you know, I have more luck getting all this off while it's on clay than on this tinfoil. It's taken a lot of this tinfoil with it, which is totally fine. Let me see if I can peel some of that off. Yeah, that'll be nice. So that's not too bad, actually. Peels right off like a sticker. For that question, Scott. Yeah, that's good great question. question. Yeah. Yeah, it depends how many how much form you have. Sometimes if it's just like uh like do I have it in here? Let me see if I have it. Like uh I, I don't seem to have it here. Let me check one more thing. Ah here it is. Okay. So even when I make uh, eyelids for spherical eyes, like this is a wooden sphere they use for eyes, I do the same thing. I just cover this with tape, okay? And then it kind of comes off, like you're saying, like a shell. And then I could just cut those pieces. But this is the same uh, technique I use to cover uh, these types of eyes. If you look for this wrong, it's more for this shape one, yeah. So. It's the same technique. You can really use this to create just the head, the body, the arms. It's just a pattern making technique. Again, this is the same technique I used to make my wife's wedding dress too. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> so, let me get this off here. this to be able to stick to the paper will make it a much more accurate pattern for cutting too. There we go.
go to the top view in just a minute. I'm going to try to lay this all flat on the paper. Yeah, I can see some things are going to have to be separate pieces without a doubt. Okay. <clears throat> so, right now, this is looking quite interesting, huh? So, you can see it does not want to lay flat. And that's because some of these uh, do need to be separate pieces. It looks like I didn't cut through all the way. Let me just cut this piece here. So there's my muzzle. Ooh, that cheek turned out nice. I'm going to use scissors just to cut this line better. So if you remember, we have the back of the head here. And like I said, ooh, I lucked out. So the, this is the point of the cheek. It goes up to the back of the head and the top of the head. Okay. Now this piece is going to have to be two separate pieces, which I had a feeling it was going to be, but I just wanted to check it myself. And also, whenever I lay out my pattern, I lay it out just like this, kind of in order of where it kind of goes together. So this creates the funnel for that whole cheek. That's the piece going together in there. That's what opens it up. And there's my bottom jaw. This didn't go through all the way either. There we have it. And here, I'm able to get this down into one, two, three, four, five pattern pieces, okay? And like I said before, if you feel like this is too few pattern pieces for you, you could easily just take these. Now that it's flat, you could continue these lines. Some people like to continue some of these lines, which isn't always a bad idea. I could continue this line all the way like this. And um, another reason to cut this into smaller pieces is to potentially save foam for, your, for yourself. Let's say you don't have a piece of foam this big, right? You could dice up this pattern into smaller pieces and be able to glue them together, okay? That can, uh, that can be a savings for you just like that. Now, from here, what, actually, what I typically do at this point is I take a downward photo of the pattern and then I typically bring it into um, a program like Adobe Illustrator, and then I digitally trace it. And then I can scale the pattern to whatever size that I want, since it'll be a vector. Um, and then I just print it into sections, or I go to the printer and print it larger. But I, I just started doing that about two years ago. Before that, I would just take this piece and trace it. And that's what I'm gonna do right now, is trace all these darts and transfer my notches. And I just have to remember that since I'm tracing these, I have to justify the cut to the inside of the line when I go to cut out this pattern at whatever scale it becomes. Notch 
right there. And then it will have a notch there too. So now if I peel this off, we have the pattern. And I'll just uh, label this a back of head. I'll put a small label here. front of the cheek here. Put a notch there. And then I'll put a notch right here. And then I'm going to write cheek front. Label that. This is a strange piece here. Um, I wonder if I can attach. Yeah, I think that goes to there. Yeah, this is going to stay a separate piece. Okay. I'm just going to trace this. some of these registration marks so because this little line here has to register with this corner so I want to make sure I have lines there and then I'll just do a one two three dash one two three so I know that those are the two sides that go together let me move this up a little bit What's nice about this technique too is you could blow this up to be a mascot head. You could, you know, keep it. You could just blow it up a little bit, make it a, a puppet head, whatever your needs are. So we'll have that. So I'll put here bottom jaw. And just so I remember. Uh, a lot of times I'll just draw an eye where about the eye would go because that's about where the eyeball would go for the puppet depending on the design. So this kind of keeps me uh, focused. Mark the center front. This is a center front line. And this line right here, the bottom of the jaw, also a center front line. Now this muzzle really could be couple pieces but I think it's fine I'm gonna leave it as is oops hold on a second I didn't put in that line big enough let me trim that This is going to line up between those two pieces there. So there we have it. So this is this is our pattern. So th then another thing I'll do before I go to scaling this is uh, you have to remember that any imperfections in this will get blown up with however much you scale it. So. If you have some kind of real jagged lines, uh, you want to kind of smooth those out before you use this pattern. And part of that's there because of the scale. It could be a could have been small imperfections in the the sculpture, especially if you're using the tin foil. Well, I mean, look at the texture. 
some of that can translate. But uh, especially once you get used to it, you start to understand where lines should be smoother and where they shouldn't be, okay? So right here, I can, I can tell automatically here that this is something that needs to be smoothed out. And some of the smoothing I would do in Illustrator as well. Okay, just so easy to do it there. But it's not a bad idea to go over it with your, your pen. You could have made the mouth plate uh, shape there, at least the starting point for it. I like to do that after uh, with the foam. So this is so this should probably be screwed up a little bit too, be a smoother line like that. And since this piece connects there, I gotta probably take this in a little bit. Since that's where that little bump is. Subtracted there, added there. Smooth out those pieces. Uh, a piece of advice I would give to anyone who really wants to bump up their patterning is uh, a great way to practice if you don't want to waste foam <clears throat> is to take the puppets you have already and drape new clothing for them. If you can do this with clothing, that'll make uh, your foam patterning a thousand times better. You have to be much more precise with the clothing. It's also cheaper to practice on it for, again, like I said, because you can get fabric much cheaper than you can foam in most cases. Okay, so that's looking, let's get this jar and we'll smooth this out here. But that is looking pretty good. Do we have any, oh, we're starting to get our final 15 minutes here. I wish we could kind of do some more Q&A. But one more thing, a, a, a nice point that I want to make about this is with this pattern, a lot of people always ask me, is can I use the same pattern for the foam is that I'm gonna use for the fabric covering? And I, I like to say no. Uh, you, you, if you do it, you might be able to get away with it. Some people say, what if I just add like a half inch or quarter of an inch of seam allowance? You, you'll probably get away with it, right? But the reasons why I recommend not to do that is just because it's, it really requires a different pattern when you use a different material. Foam is different than fabric. It's in the same way if you look at like a pair of jeans versus like a pair of leggings, right? There's two completely different patterns for these uh, pieces of clothing, uh, even though they go over the same spot on your body. It's because of its taking advantage of the material. Okay, most fleeces that you'll use, if you use a fleece covering, will have a little bit of stretch to it. Okay, and that's something you want to take advantage of with the pattern making process. Um, and also, too, you know, when you, you know, the foam has a thickness because this is foam patterning. The, the thickness of the foam, that, this is actually a really interesting thing. Let me grab a piece of foam so I can demonstrate it to you. foam here has a thickness okay this is a half inch foam when you do a pattern piece that is flat okay the pattern line is anywhere inside of this okay it can be top it can be middle it depends on where you place it as soon as you start adding introducing curves to this especially compound curves where that pattern line is changes okay so for example the the pattern when it's following this shape if it's a perfect circle if it's a perfect sphere you're making the pattern line is in the center of the foam which means you have this quarter inch of thickness added on top of your 
of your um, sculpture. Your sculpture is going to be, if you made a paper pattern and then made it out of foam, it would be overall about a quarter of an inch wider. Okay? So that's something to take in, into account. And, and depending on the curves, it'll, um, it can really meander a lot. So again, with a perfect sphere, it's right in the center. If you have some of these shapes moving around, it can justify higher or lower. So, um, you know, again, it really depends on how detailed you want to be with your, with your sculptures. But um, at this point, uh, ready to take any questions anybody may have about this process or about puppet making tips in general, anything at all, you can, uh, you can start asking away if you have any. Or even if it's something uh, you didn't get a close enough look at, I can show you a little closer or something like that. to see if in the chat a question is here. Here. Question here. Yeah, I have here uh, five pieces for this one. Can you scale the pattern manually? Yeah, there's projection techniques you can use. Um, I, I don't use any of those. Um, oh yeah, that's what I can talk a little bit about is how I scale the puppet, okay? So here's what I do is I take, whoop, I take my, well, usually my sculpture is not that uh, deformed after, but this will work. But what I'll do is I'll measure the height of this puppet, of this sculpture. And in this case, the height of it is two inches even. Okay, two inches. And I decide how big I want the my actual head to be. So this puppet, Looking at uh, my hand, I probably want this puppet to be about that tall, which is, let's say, seven inches. Keep it even. Yeah, we'll do seven inches. Okay. So then in this, seven inches is equal to two inches in this um, algorithm. Um, now, in my video, I, I show the exact uh, mathematics to use. And, and to be honest, sometimes I reference back to my own video just because I don't, I don't always remember it. I did the work once there, so I can. Uh, ha my videos that I make are mostly for myself, just so I can remember how I did things. So, but uh, so now what I'm going to do is measure. Oh yeah. So again, so so this is a hundred percent scale. That's what it is. So this is the scale of the pattern right now. I want a two inch height overall, and that's 100% scale, because this is 100% scale right now. So what I need to do is find out the scale that I would blow this up to at when I bring this pattern to um, Kinko's or wherever you take it. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, when I was in school, we learned it as is over of, I'm not sure what they're teaching now with it, it's crazy. Let me get to my calculator here. So essentially what you do is this number times this number divided by that number. And this is actually simple math, but just for completeness, I will do it on a calculator for you. So seven times 100, which is 700, okay, divided by two, which is also easy math, which is 350. So that means when I take this pattern to uh, Kinko's, I know I want to blow it up to 350%, and that should give me the right scale head that I need. Now, one problem that I know people have had from watching my videos is they just think these are numbers you always use. Oh, anytime you do a small maquette head, you blow it up to 350. Absolutely not. You really have to do this math each time because 
if if this if this was a quarter of an inch smaller of a sculpture, that would throw off this whole uh, all this math that we just did. Okay, and same as maybe you want the head to be a little bit bigger. I generally like my hand puppets a little bit on the smaller side. So, um, and actually what I would honestly do is, because uh, I didn't really take into account that thickness of the foam like I was saying. So a lot of times what I do is I, I think of this as my biggest. So when I go to Kinko's, it's so cheap to print it too. So what I'll ask for is I'll ask for a 300%. Um, probably like a, a 315%. 325, a 340, and a 350. That way I only have to make one trip, okay? And then usually what I'll do is I'll pick usually about the center one. So I usually start here, and if it's perfect, I won the lottery, okay? If I say, oh, you know what? It needs to be a lot bigger. Then I'll just go straight to the 350 where I was. It needs to be a little bigger, 340. A lot smaller, a little smaller. So that's another little trick that can kind of save you a little bit of time. And then and then just, yeah, just write down your notes so you remember exactly what um, uh, scale. Can I save all those patterns, right? Because let's say I make that puppet and I love it. And it becomes one of my main characters. Hey, I want to make uh, the baby version, right? Or I want that wolf to have like a, a cub. So then I'll just use the 300% the if I went with the 340 for my main one, right? Or, or I can take that pattern and scale it down even more. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and options for stuff like that. And again, after I do this pattern making process, like I said, I cut in my own entrance hole. And then um, from there, I drape my fabric pattern on top of that foam pattern. And then I trace it digitally the same way. So that I keep it all together as one file. I, I get all these um, envelopes like this that I fold up my finished patterns in and keep it in. And also, I keep the original um, paper that I created the pattern on too, just so I can always kind of look back at it as a reference. Um, I kind of think of this as like the finished puzzle pieces, so I know uh, how these pieces go to better. I have a visual cue for it. So, but yeah. That's it. Someone asked if I've ever submerged a puppet underwater for a film or a show. Um, I have not. I know that's a thing people have done, but I, I've not submerged it. I'm actually working on a production, a couple productions right now that we're trying to to get off uh, get off the ground. We just did all the composing of the music, and we're going to start singing the track soon. I got to start building some puppets for it. It's going to be a big to do. I was hoping for it to come out in November. The Littlest Snow Monster was a, a stage play that we did that we're kind of turning into a like a short film essentially. So that's going to be it's going to be quite a bear to do. So look forward to that. Hopefully in November. Worst case the following year in November. Let me see here. We have some more questions. People saying thanks. Sure thing. Happy to help. Yeah, and if you guys ever have any questions, um, you can contact me uh, anytime. The best place to contact me is um, is Instagram, private messaging, DMs. Um, the worst place to ever get a hold of me is through email. I would not recommend it, even if you happen to find my email address. It's My email is a dumpster fire. So <laughs> uh, Instagram is definitely the best place to do it. Or actually, uh, Facebook. Facebook DMs I don't seem to get often. I feel like I get a notification like for every 10 that come through. Uh, so if you're on Facebook, the best place to get a hold of me is actually in the... I, I created a Facebook group for my tutorials. It's called the Kruttinger Puppets Tutorial Q&A Group. And that's a great way to get a hold of me as well. And not only that, if you actually post your question there... I've answered a lot of the same questions for people. Sometimes someone else will answer it before I can even get to it. And then I'll chime in later like, oh yeah, they're right and looks good. Keep going. So it's a great place to get some support or even just post your finished puppets. Cause I'd love, I love when people take some of these techniques that they learn from me or inspired by, or they just want to show me. If you tag me on Instagram, 
or on Twitter or on Facebook. Twitter is another way you can actually get a hold of me sometimes too. But um, but yeah, that's what I would recommend. Have I ever built a puppet with this pattern? Um, I, not yet, but I will soon because I this pattern has only been in existence for about 15 minutes. So I've not built a puppet with this pattern yet, not yet. But um, I will. I actually, I might even, since I'm recording this anyway, I might uh, turn this into a tutorial video or redo it. We'll see. We will see. Let's see. My name is Ted. I'm, 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 I joined Puppet Pie and, and, I, and I made my own puppet chair. And I'm in the, and I'm in the progress of making, well, Hey, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah, I like that a lot. Hey, and yeah, and then I'm planning to make this into a monkey. Oh yeah, I really like that. That's a great design. That's really fun. Yeah, that's really yeah, great. Uh, I see another question here too, uh, Adam. I know you have a magician puppet. Uh, do you ever use real magic to perform with it? We actually used to do that all the time. I've got my magician puppet Felix there. We used to do real magic tricks with him because he has two live hands. Uh, most of his effects that he could do were things like with a change bag and um, a little bit of uh, card prediction stuff by having someone pick a card and having it in a prediction. So you are limited. But the advantage of something like that, too, is you could do things with the puppet that you couldn't ever do with a real magician. Like when I have him like pull streamers out of his ears, that's because there's a hole in his head and he actually has streamers in his head. So you can take advantage of that. And you might say that's less magic. People know how it's done. But at the end of the day, it's a show. You're trying to entertain people, not necessarily trying to trick them. And uh, even if you're doing a magic show as a human puppet, that's good uh, philosophy to, to live by. Because I used to be a magician as well. 